In the last six lectures, we have addressed sources of international law as captured in the statute of the ICJ. For the seventh lecture in this lecture series, we will be taking a deeper dive into the field of international law. As you may have noticed from our previous videos, the realm of international law is distinct. Though a system of law, it varies significantly in a number of ways from municipal systems. To this end, what we'll be addressing in this lecture, what it means to be a subject of international law. We would examine also the scope of the rights and obligations enjoyed by subjects of international law. We will examine the concept of legal personality and we will also look at various examples of subjects of international law and the legal personality they enjoy. To the first question, who or what are subjects of international law? The term subject connotes the bringing of an entity under the control of another person or thing, such that the entity is bound by certain norms and is obligated to perform a number of functions and desist from others. So when you think about it in this way, subjects of international law are entities that are bound by certain norms, possess international rights and obligations, and the capacity to maintain such rights by bringing international claims where these rights have been breached. In this way, international subjects embody obligations that they must fulfill or acts and conduct that they must desist from or face the consequences for internationally wrongful acts. In such instances, errant subjects open themselves up to international claims. As I would explain shortly, the extent to which an international subject can bring claims is shrouded around the question of legal personality, which has primarily been seen as a prerequisite for the development of international law. As the determinant for whether an entity is a legal person follows the question, thus the entity in question have a right to bring claims in respect of international breaches. Going off this premise then, states have traditionally been deemed the primary and most important subject of international law because they have the capacity to bring claims for internationally wrongful acts or breaches of international law that affect them. As you can imagine, the public international law domain in the beginning era dealt mainly with state-to-state -state interaction, but we saw the 18th to 19th century begin to introduce subjects of international law that are atypical. And we will take a look at this atypical subject of international law in a moment. So first, atypical subjects of international law. These subjects of international law are irregular, they're non-conforming, and they do not possess the same attributes of the typical subjects of international law, which are states. And so these entities do not possess the characteristics of statehood under international law. The concept of statehood we will address in another lecture. These entities have been deemed sovereign entities under international law, even though they do not possess these key attributes, and they have been granted status at the United Nations, and they equally maintain diplomatic relations with many nations of the world. One example of this non-conforming subject of international law is the Holy See. The Holy See was established as a subject of international law 
by the Lutheran Treaty of 1929. Another example is the Sovereign Order of Malta. And a third example is the International Committee of the Red Cross. Speaking about subjects of international law, international organizations have also been deemed to be subjects of international law. So the development in the 20th century led to the conferment of the status of subjects of international law on international organizations. Here, we see what is akin to a functional status. So we see that international organizations have a somewhat partial legal personality based on their founding document. For example, in 1993, the World Health Organization submitted a question to the ICJ for determination, asking, in view of the health and environmental effects, would the use of nuclear weapons by a state in war or other armed conflicts be a breach of its obligations under international law, including the WHO constitution? And so in the 1996 advisory opinion in the legality of the use by a state of nuclear weapon in arms conflict, given by the ICJ in addressing the question put to it by the World Health Organization in 1993, the court stated in paragraph 19 that the constituent instruments of international organizations are also treaties of a particular type. Their object is to create new subjects of law endowed with a certain autonomy to which the parties entrust the task of realizing common goals. And so here we see that reference to the organization's founding document is always a place to look at in making a determination of whether an international organization has been given the status of a subject of international law. And that ever so often, we see that the conferment of legal personality and its status as a subject of international law for organizations such as the World Health Organization is for the allowance of a certain level of autonomy to enable the performance of duties assigned to them. So in the same advisory opinion in paragraph 24, The ICJ holds that the court need hardly point out that international organizations are subjects of international law, which do not, unlike states, possess a general competence. International organizations are governed by the principle of specialty. That is to say, they are invested by the state which create them with powers the limits of which are a function of the common interest whose promotion those states entrust to them. So as we've stated, the status of international organizations as a subject of international law rests squarely on the fact that such a status enables them to fully perform the functions that have been given to them by states. And quite often, the founding or the constituent document of that international organization will be the place to look in determining if such an organization has a legal personality or what status it enjoys on the international law. Now, to another curious subjects of international law. Non-self-governing people, insurgents, and movements of the national liberation. This is a somewhat unusual categorization, and here's why. On the international law, representation is generally on a nation-state basis. The implication is that for there to be representation on the international law, there's a recognized de facto, and de jure government. But with non-self-governing people, 
insurgent groups, and movements of national liberation, this combination is lacking. That means there is no representation of a people as a nation. So under the typical tenets of international law, it will seem impossible to participate in the international law plane. But in reality, where rebels or insurgent groups have acquired de facto control of a particular territory and the disruption that has resulted from this control of that territory has reached a certain degree of intensity, certain international rules of law of war apply to designate such belligerent groups subject of international law. As it relates to the status of national liberation movements, with the practical dismantling of colonization, the status of national liberation movements as subjects of international law is diminishing. Notwithstanding this, the Palestine Liberation Organization, PLO, in occupied territory by Israel, is an important exception. As such, they enjoy status as subjects of international law. Now to another class of subjects of international law, individuals. And we begin to see this with the emergence of international human rights complaint system. The conclusion is that individuals have acquired a relevant position in international law as subjects of obligation. In another video, we will explore the human rights system and the rich offerings for procedural protection for international human rights violations through the human rights communication and complaint system. For today's lecture, we're concerned only about expressing how that system translates to giving individual status as partial subjects of international law. Because as we would examine in more depth subsequently, while many norms of international law, because of their content, are only applicable to states, the obligations that it evoke apply to individuals. And so a system that allows for communication or complaint by the individuals to whom states owe an obligation for such violations of international law mark a shift in the traditional states centered structure of international law. So what I've said briefly is that generally under international law, we have established that the traditional relationship is on a state to state basis. But what we see under the international human rights regime is a system where states owe obligations to their nationals and people to which they have jurisdiction over within their territory. Where human rights have been breached, such individuals enjoy a certain level of procedural rights for violation of human rights that they have experienced. Again, we will talk a little bit more about this when we take a deeper dive into the international human rights system. And now, another subject of international law that we're beginning to see are multinational enterprises. The development in international law has seen multinational enterprises possess a functionally limited international legal personality. As you can imagine, where multinational enterprises carry out businesses in many different parts of the world, it is expected that there will be some legal redress that protects such organization from arbitrary loss of investment at the hands of uncontrolled power of municipal legal systems. This development stems mainly from international investment law. According to the principles of the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, ICSID, states and multinational companies are considered equal parts to a dispute, once brought under the ICSID dispute settlement procedure. According to Article 25 of the Convention on the Settlement of Investment Disputes between States and Nationals of Other States, 
The ICSID has jurisdiction between contracting states or any constituent subdivision or agency of a contracting state designated to the center by the state and a national of another contracting state. It goes ahead to define national of another contracting state in Article 25 sub 2 as a natural person or any juridical person of a state other than the state party. In this way, we see another shade of functional or limited legal personality in respect of corporations. What this means is that the legal personality that multinational enterprises enjoy is to ensure that states are not utilizing state machinery to cause loss of investment to multinational corporations within their territory. And so what the international law regime, specifically within the context of international investment law does, is to allow a system that puts the state and the multinational company on the same level when it does come before the ICSID to ensure that both parties are given equal and fair treatment in dealing with international claims or claims that arise from international investment. Summarily, we have unpacked the concept of subjects of international law, the concept of legal personality, some categories of subjects of international law, and the type or level of legal personality they enjoy under international law. So I want to say thank you so much for joining in, and remember to like, share, subscribe, and hit the notification button so that you're notified when there's a new video. Thank you.